Okay, welcome to the ASEMS virtual public lecture series. My name is Rob Heinemann. I'm a chief investigator with the Australian Research Centre for Excellence in Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers, otherwise known as ASEMS. And I'm also a professor of statistics and head of the Department of Econometrics and Business Statistics at Monash University. I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who've been custodian of this land for thousands of years. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be online with us today. Today's lecture will be recorded and made available on the ASEMS website, and we'll give you the link at the end. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Galit Schmoyli, who's presenting today as part of the ASEMS virtual lecture series. I've known Galit for about 10 years. She has visited us at Monash University on a couple of occasions and was due to visit again this March. However, the pandemic intervened and we had to postpone her visit. So I'm delighted that we could host her virtually instead today. Galit Schmoyli is Distinguished Professor and Director of the Institute of Service Science at the National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. Prior to that, she's worked in India, Bhutan, the United States and Israel. She was a Chair Professor of Data Analytics at the Indian School of Business and has been Associate Professor at the University of Maryland Smith School of Business. She's the Founding Editor-in-Chief of Inform's Journal on Data Science. Her research focuses on statistical and data mining methods for contemporary data structures with a focus on statistical strategy. Issues related to how data analytics are used in scientific research. And her main fields of application are information systems, electronic commerce, biosurveillance and healthcare with a focus on human behaviour. And that's what she's going to talk about today. So Galit, welcome and thank you for joining today. I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, let me share my screen. So thank you everybody for um, uh, attending. Some of you are attending at uh, uncomfortable hours and I appreciate that. And even if it's comfortable, um, thank you for attending. And thank you for ASIMS for the invitation and Rob for hosting this. Um, the talk I'm going to present today uh, has quotes on its first word, and that's improving the prediction of human behavior using behavior modification. Um, this is the first public talk I'm giving about this research of mine that is relatively recent. So I'm very excited to present it and very much looking forward to uh, hearing or maybe reading uh, your questions and your feedback. You can, of course, also email me afterwards. I'm easy to find. Okay, so what am I going to be talking about? Um, second. Um, the famous historian Yuval Noah Harari, who's written several very famous books, you probably know, at least Homo Deus, has written recently that the main products of the 21st century economy will not be textiles, vehicles, and weapons, but rather bodies, brains, and minds instead. And in this new kind of economy where humans are really perceived as products or as data, a lot of new interesting things, um, some good and some bad are arising, which as researchers, we want to be able to um, represent, understand, and analyze. So in this talk, I'm going to take my statistician data miner hat and try and analyze what is going on in this new world where companies are viewing humans as products and as data. The talk today has three parts. The first two parts are a background so that everybody has an idea of what's going on. And then in the third part, I'll introduce my, uh, my new discoveries. I realize that our audience here is a really wide range. People who don't know any statistics to data scientists who've been working and machine learners for a while. And I'm gonna try and cater to everybody. Um, I hope you all learned something new from, from the talk. So the first part is gonna talk about how internet platforms predict user behavior. And I'm gonna introduce the notion of behavioral big data and explain what I mean by it, because this is gonna be important. And then I'm gonna talk about how these kinds of data are being collected and used to predict user behavior by platforms. Then I'll introduce how statistics and machine learning as two research areas what now is called AI by many people, is used to predict. And I'll give a very basic answer down there. And then I'll get to what affects prediction accuracy and how statisticians and machine learners try to use um, uh, tools to understand what affects prediction accuracy. So that's the first part. The second part, I'll talk briefly about how internet platforms modify user behavior. 
So I'm not talking about prediction now, I'm talking about manipulating user behavior. And in the third part, this is where I introduce my own new research. It brings these two pieces together to combine how using behavior modification can be used to quote unquote improve prediction. And I'm gonna show you how I'm using a statistical approach to analyze this kind of interesting new strategy. And I will share some alarming discoveries that I hope will be useful to, um, to you as humans and users, uh, to you as data scientists, and if anybody here works at the big platforms or works for insurance companies, or I, I think this is gonna be useful at any level. So let's start. Number one is prediction. And I'm going to tell you how internet platforms uh, predict user behavior. Before that, I wanna talk about behavioral big data. So behavioral data is a kind of data that has been collected for a very long time, for ages by uh, psychologists, sociologists, economists, you know, social scientists, behavioral researchers. And behavioral data means people's measurable actions, reactions, interactions, self-reported opinions, their thoughts, their feelings. If you've ever answered a survey, which I'm sure you've all done, that's behavioral data. Uh, when people observe other people and record it, that's uh, behavioral data. And all that, again, has been happening for, for many, many years. On the other end of the spectrum, a lot of you know what big data is. And big data can refer also to measuring things uh, that are inanimate. Um, so big data will typically refer to lots of records, um, often will come from multiple data sources that get linked and graded together. They're very rich data. They have detailed information about every record. And they will typically be at the micro level. So for example, you won't be looking at store level information. You'll be looking at product level information. And when you merge these two things in this new world now, we have what's called behavioral big data, which is this huge amount of data on many people coming in from multiple sources and getting integrated. It's very rich, it's very detailed, and it's micro level. Not only is it at the individual users or person, but it can also be within a certain context, time of day, a certain app, a certain behavior. So it's very, very detailed, it's very rich, and it's very large. And it gives us not only information about individuals, but also about the connectivity between them. So this social structure that we're getting is really a, a new thing uh, in terms of the measurable ability that we have. Now, traditional companies such as banks, credit card companies, uh, retailers, you know, su large supermarkets, and of course, insurers have been collecting behavioral big data for, for a long time, even before we started using these terms, big data. Um, and they've been using this data for multiple different reasons. One of them is to predict our future behavior. So for example, insurance companies will collect your, your, uh, your behavioral data in order to try and predict your risk and then set your premium accordingly. Uh, retailers will use it to offer coupons and things like that. But what has changed even for the traditional companies is that behavioral big data today is a lot more powerful. Why? Because the devices that measure our behaviors are now becoming much closer into our private spaces. And uh, a lot of times they're not noticeable by us already. So for example, if you, um, if you own a home or you live inside a house, which I think a lot of people are doing right now, and you have any kind of smart device in your home, it's recording a lot of your behavioral information. If you have these uh, smart thermostats that measure the temperatures, they know exactly which person is in which room because different people can set it to different temperatures when you're coming and when you're going maybe you left your um your home when you're not supposed to leave it um if you have robots that clean your floors they have your floor plans um they know when you're turning them on and when you're turning them off so a lot of information about your home that's being collected by devices there is giving us a lot of behavioral data about the people who live there another private space that's been invaded is our car and uh, many insurance companies now will ask you to plug in a little device into your car that will measure not just you know, where you're going or your speed, but how you're driving. How are you taking the turns? Um, are you accelerating too fast? And that's again, kinds of behavioral data that insurance companies did not have before, but they're using them now. Let's move even closer. On top of our bodies, we're wearing these smart wearables. And smart wearables measure, again, not only where we're going, but also all kinds of ways that we're using and doing things and not doing things. If you're using a fitness band, these fitness bands tell us a lot about us. 
uh, about our behaviors. They measure anything from sleep to um, uh, how many emails are incoming. Some of them can even uh, measure your keystrokes when you're typing. Um, of course, they can also measure your blood pressure, which correlates many times with your emotional states or with other behaviors that you're doing. So lots of behavioral data. And if we go even closer, if you want to think of it that way, we're now also talking to some of our devices and kids are also another rich uh, source of behavioral big data, if you think about it. The smart toys that they're interacting with and talking to provide a lot of um, uh, new kinds of data to traditional companies. Why do these companies want to collect these data to predict our behavior? For lots of reasons. They want to personalize and improve their products and services. Some of them use it to detect fraud. Um, some of them use it for advertising or for marketing, and also some use it for logistics and operations. This is the traditional companies, but the really interesting new players on the block are the internet platforms. And internet platforms are basically any kind of, if you think of it as like a website or, or an app, that has lots of users and consumers or, or groups of people interacting with the technology and sometimes interacting with each other. And if you're using any of the devices shown up here, then uh, you are an internet platform user. Uh, I think by just using Zoom here, you're already probably a, a user. And they too use the information that they collect about our behavior to predict future behaviors. Um, you know, anything from a sharing economy are platforms, Ubers and Lyft, uh, Airbnb is a platform. If you're working online or, or using workers online through Amazon Mechanical Turk, that's a platform. Of course, eBay and online auctions. Uh, online dating, those are big platforms. They bring together people. If you're uh, doing any entertainment, streaming, movies or music, Spotify, Netflix, those are platforms. And of course, we have all the social media that are huge uh, in terms of the amount of data that they collect about us. And why do these platforms all collect the data and why do they want to predict our future behavior? For the exact same reasons that the traditional companies do. They want to personalize and improve their products and services. Some of them use it for fraud detection. Advertising is a major business model for several of these platforms. So Google and Facebook, that's where they make a ton of money. Uh, marketing, logistics and operations, again, are other reasons that these companies will collect behavioral big data. Let me just um, uh, remind you that we're all actually contributing voluntarily a lot of behavioral big data. So anytime we open an account on a platform, we provide our personal details. Every time you post photos or comments, uh, you, you, you have messaging with other people. Uh, even when you post on the Q&A here, you've basically contributed behavioral big data. Uh, when you search on Google or on Bing, when you're bidding in auctions, when you like other people's um, uh, posts, uh, when you purchase something and you put in your payment information, and very importantly, when you make connections or create friends, whether it's on LinkedIn or on Facebook or whatever it is, Instagram, you've just contributed your BBD. Now, you might think, okay, well, if users are contributing it, then, then fine, they should know it. Well, a lot of times we're not thinking about it, especially a lot of young people don't think about it. Um, and there's a lot of extra data that's being collected that we're not really aware that we are providing. So um, this is information that's available to the platform because you are interacting with the platform itself. And I'll give you an example. If you've ever, uh, if you've owned or if you've seen the Microsoft Xbox 360 gaming console, it comes with a microphone, a camera, and a technology that recognizes users' voice and face. And if you look at their terms and condition about the kind of data they collect about you, um, I wonder how many people here actually read it. Here's just a little snippet. So here's some of the data they collect about you. Sign in and sign off. That also includes when you sign in and sign off. The games you played, your score statistics, information about the console hardware and operating performance. This is kind of standard. Then they say to prevent cheating, we're also collecting your location, your IP address, and your operating system and software version. And now it gets really interesting. To improve your experience, we're also collecting your Bing search terms. So if you were searching online on Bing, right? Some people use Bing, some people use Google. Uh, they're looking at what you're searching for. Samples of voice commands uh, that you're using there. Um, what you watched on Xbox TV service, music and videos you've watched and listened to. All this information is being collected about you. Remember, there's also a camera that can actually detect facial uh, um, movements very carefully. What do they use it for? 
Well, the most um, well-known use that's been in the news is advertising. So they use this so that they can then um, package this information and sell it to advertisers in this way or the other. But I want to make an important point here is that even if you're aware that they're using it for advertising and they say it up front, sometimes the platforms will change the uses that or come up with a new usage of the BBD that they have not maybe thought of earlier on when they were collecting it and wrote the terms and conditions that you consented to. So for example, uh, later on, Microsoft uh, declared that they're gonna be using their data also to ban offensive language from their services. So if you're using Skype, Xbox, Office, or whatever, your data is being used for this new goal that they came up with. Whether you agree with it or not, it's too late. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit more specifically about what kind of behaviors exactly are predicted. And then I'll talk about how it's done very generally. Here's a new product that uh, Google launched recently. It's called Predictive Audiences and it's intended for advertisers. So Google's huge customer is advertisers who uh, pay for advertising on Google. And you can see that they're selling these advertisers, um, audiences of people, of Google users, who are likely to purchase whatever item that advertiser is selling in the next seven days. So they're selling them a prediction of our future behavior. Um, you can see they're also selling them likely seven day churning purchasers, meaning people who will leave their product within the next seven days. And this is an interesting example of the kinds of predictions that they're now offering to their own customers. How do they do this? Well, first of all, they're gonna use the BBD that we just talked about. And they're going to use statistical and machine learning methods to develop predictive methods. But one thing that's important to understand is that they predict very specific user behaviors. It's not just predicting, let's see what this person will do tomorrow. That's too vague. They predict precise things. We saw two things already. Um, we saw purchase probability in the next seven days of a certain product. We saw churn probability in the next seven days for a certain product. They can also measure things like how long you spend on their website, time on site, let's say per day on average, or time on an app if they have an app. They can want to predict the emotional state. And there have been several studies showing that they can actually predict your emotional state in certain contexts and times pretty well. They can predict voting tendencies, and they can even predict certain life events, such as births, um, uh, um, and even pregnancies. We can uh, predict uh, changes in jobs according to behavioral data that they have and a lot more. So it's a little alarming when you realize what they can predict uh, pretty decently. How does this work? So here's the behind the scenes from the statistical or machine learning um, approach. We have user profile data. This is the BBD, all the past behavior, your location, your friends and everything that we have about you. We have a specific behavior that we're trying to predict. So let's say it's time on app, how long you spend every day on our app. And I'm going to try and link your, your um, user profile information with a specific behavior that I care about. I'm gonna take a whole set of existing users and based on their data, I'm gonna try and build a predictive model that links these two sources of data. This is called building a predictive model or training a predictive model. And once I've built such kind of a model that, based, that is based on the correlations between these two things, I can use this model to predict new users. So now if I have a new user and I have a predictive model, I plug in the user's profile, these new users' profile data, and it will give me a prediction for their time on app. Okay, so we start with a group of people who we know their actual time on app. We link that to their BBD. And then we can build a model that will help us predict it for people who we don't currently have their time on app. Now I'm going to introduce a little bit of statistical notation. So for those of you who have never seen any of this, don't worry. Um, this is gonna be pretty straightforward. Why am I introducing statistical notation? Because we can talk in words as much as we want, but then there's some phenomena that in order to analyze really what are the sources of what's going on, we need to have notation that helps us break down things into formulas. So I'll show you the benefit of this throughout this talk. So suppose that the behavior that we're interested in is time on app. We're gonna denote this behavior of interest as Y. Y is this little letter here, that's the behavior that we're gonna to want to predict later on. 
And we're going to use X for the user profile, which can include lots of information. Again, all the different behaviors and friends and locations and things like that. So this is the user's profile, X. And now we're going to try and build a predictive model that we're denoting by F. So F is a function that links the user profile to the time on app. This is a function. But because you might have people who have the same user profile, and still they, they spend different amounts of time on the app, we need to accommodate this difference between people's, people who have the same profile. And that's why we add this additional term here called an error. And this error accounts for a variation between people who have the same profile X. Okay, so this F here is what links, this is the predictive model that will link the user profile to the observed user behavior time on app. Once I built this model and I have my F of X, I'm going to use data to do that. And now I'm going to use it as a predictive model. Now you see these little two hats at the top. This is because we start using a notation called a hat notation. And a hat just means that we add a little caret like this on top of our letters. So a Y hat means the predicted time on app. Remember Y was your observed time on app. We actually know how much time you spent. Y hat is a predicted time on app. And F hat is the predictive function. This is the predictive model that we're going to have. So now when you see the little picture here at the bottom, you'll see we have F hat that links the X, the user profile, for a Y hat. This is a predicted user's behavior. That's it. That's the notation that we're going to use throughout, and you'll see in a minute why this is useful. So hats are useful for prediction. We're going to look now at what affects prediction accuracy. What do I mean? I mean that I want to know how well I can predict a new user's behavior. I built a model, I have their user BBD. How well can I get to your real Y from your predicted Y hat? And in order to measure this, we use something called the expected prediction error. So again, expected prediction error is measuring how well you can predict a new user's behavior um, using your, your data and your model. And I'm gonna show this to you with a story. So suppose we're looking at um, Uber Eats drivers, okay? So we have the Uber platform and Uber is trying to um, link the risk of their drivers who drive around delivering food. And the risk is going to be measured by how much time they're spending on the app. Because when you're driving, the more time you're spending on the app, you're more risky. So a risky driver is one who spends a long time on the app. And your profile, we're gonna keep it simple. So we're only gonna use the trip distance that you're going to be traveling. So X, X axis down here, is the distance. And um, you see that we have drivers who are driving short um, distances X1, medium distances X2, and long uh, distances X3. And these different circles are different drivers, okay? So even for drivers who drive the same long distance, we see that they have different risks because different drivers might be spending different amounts of time on the app. Now, suppose that we, there, we knew the true function that linked this risk or time on app to the trip distance. Suppose it's this curve, curvy here, curve function here, f of x. If I knew this function, then my best predictions for every distance would be these little red x's on the curve. I would say, okay, if you're going long distance, then your predicted risk is this amount. It's not gonna be accurate for all the different drivers because there's some lower and higher risk drivers here, but on average, this is the best I can do. So this is what I'm gonna call the ideal predicted outcomes. Unfortunately, unlike in physics, when we're talking about user behavior, we really don't have closed formulas and true functions of what is risk as a function of trip distance. So I don't really have the true function. And I'm gonna, I might use domain knowledge or I might use huge amounts of data to try and come up with my best guess of what this function looks like. So maybe I think that it's a linear function like this. So I'm gonna think, okay, if I had unlimited data, I really think that your risk increases linearly with the distance. The longer you're driving, you know, you're gonna be spending more time on the app and your risk is going higher up. If this is the way I'm thinking, then my predictions now are going to be the three X's on the linear line here, on the straight line. And notice that they're not the same as the ones that we saw in the true function. So there's a little bit of an error that's coming in, creeping in here, but there's nothing I can do about it because I don't know the true function. And there's a little bit more bad news. We don't typically have unlimited data. So even though everybody thinks, oh, big data, we have all the data in the world, we might have data about all our users in the past, but we don't have data about our users in the future. So we always do operate under limited data. 
And even if I know that it's a linear function, if I have data and I'm using the data to estimate the slope and intercept of this line, then my line will not be identical to the unlimited data line. And my final model will be this red line. So this is what I can do to estimate a predictive model from a data that I have. And my predictions here will be the red X's down here. Okay. So we started from a true function that we don't have. And uh, we moved to a fitted function with unlimited data. And finally, recognizing that our data are limited, we have our fitted function. And this is our final f hat of x. This is our predictive model. What does this mean? If I want to think about where do errors creep in here, let's just look at one driver for a moment. Here's a driver who's driving medium distance. See this guy down or girl down here? And um, their prediction for their risk is up here, the x here. And now the difference between these two numbers is the prediction error, right? It's how off I am in my prediction. Why am I off? Well, first of all, the red line, which is the limited data function, is, um, oops, sorry, is, <clears throat> the red line is far from the unlimited data line. So that's one source of error. Because I have limited data, there's an inaccuracy there. Another reason is that I don't have the true function. So the unlimited line, is still far from the true function, the curvy line. And that's something that we call bias. And then there's a third piece. Remember, even if I know the true function, different drivers might have slightly different risk. So that's the third piece that we call error. And again, these three pieces, what we call variance, bias, and error, they combine together to give us the expected prediction error, or how well I can predict a new user's behavior. These three things come into a formula that's called the expected prediction error. And the expected prediction error you can see here is the distance between your actual behavior and your predicted behavior. And it's squared. It doesn't matter why, but it's just squared. When we square it, we can actually write this prediction error as a sum of the three pieces I just showed you on the picture. So these things add up. And by, by looking at the formula, I'm able, as a developer of an algorithm, to figure out, oh, this algorithm has a very high bias, so it's going to have this problem. And maybe that algorithm has smaller variance. And maybe these data have less measurement error. And maybe if I approach it this way, I can shrink one of these pieces or make one of these pieces worse. So this, this formula is extremely useful to machine learners and statisticians for building and evaluating predictive models and understanding why things are working this way or the other and what's the value of new data that we start collecting. That's the value. And again, I showed you that these three pieces measure different deviations um, from, from the, um, between the individuals and the true function, between the true function and unlimited data function, and between the unlimited and limited data functions. Okay? So all I want you to remember is that there are different sources of error that creep into the prediction. Now forget prediction. We're talking about manipulating user behavior. Internet platforms um, can manipulate us very well. I think you all know that if you have notifications turned on on any of your apps on your phone or on your computer, uh, you know it. If you're addicted to any game or whatever it is, you know it. Um, what do they try to change? What kind of behaviors do they try to change? Well, same kind of things that we just talked about in prediction. They might want to influence our purchase probability, our churn probability mean leaving, uh, how long we spend on the site or on the app, emotional states, they can affect our emotional states for sure. They can, for example, sh sh filter out more of the sad content than your friends are posting, for example. Uh, voting, they can affect our voting and our life events as we've all seen. How do they do this? They do this using methodologies and techniques from psychology, um, age old, called behavior modification. Here's the official definition. Intervention designed to enhance certainty by altering causal processes that regulate behavior. Now that's a mouthful. What it means in short is that we're modifying behavior in a predictable way. If you have, again, notifications turned on on your phone, um, that is a behavior modification because once it comes there, you don't think twice, you click on it, it takes you right to the place that it's supposed to take you and you see the content that you are supposed to be seeing. What it does is it's basically hacking our lower brain, our instinctive brain, and causing us into action very quickly. Um, there are several, you know, there are multiple books about this. Uh, some are by psychologists. So uh, Nudge is a famous book by Tyler and Sunstein. 
And now what's interesting, or uh, I don't know, for me, scary, is that a lot of the people who uh, do the interface designs, the human computer interaction people, and also uh, social psychologists who now uh, teach a lot of the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. Uh, for example, BJ Fogg from Stanford has a famous book called Persuasive Technology. They teach the entrepreneurs how to uh, use these techniques when they're designing new services. So Instagram, for example, the CEO was a student of BJ Fogg. Uh, the book Hooked by Nir Eyal teaches entrepreneurs how to make uh, habit-forming apps. Um, that's exactly what's going on right now. And there's a whole host of techniques things that are called nudging and hurting and operant conditioning are things that Skinner, the famous uh, psychologist came up with a long time ago that tells us that rewarding people with different schedules, making it random when you see the likes and not is more addictive, things like that. Now the platforms can make this very personalized because they have a lot of BBD about us. So they can personalize the different kinds of behavior modifications to different people. And they can personalize different things. They can personalize the stimulus. They can personalize the content, if it's an ad or a notification. And the reinforcement schedules, they can either give you a reward or they can uh, build in streaks or they can put social pressure on you. There are lots of ways they can do it and personalize it to things that make you tick. Part three, now comes the interesting integration of what's going to happen. So this is my research where I started um, thinking about this. Um, when I read an interesting book that came out last year by <clears throat> social psychologist Shoshana Zuba from Harvard, and she wrote an interesting book, book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, where she describes how large platforms use and collect behavioral data here at the bottom for their own service improvements, but the larger surplus of the data that they collect is actually used for something completely different. They use it to create what she calls prediction products and those are sold in what she calls behavioral futures market. Now, what does this mean? They don't sell the raw data of their customers to other companies because that's way too valuable and sensitive, right? That's a competitive edge. But instead, they generate predictions like the ones I showed you with the Google uh, predictive audiences. And that is the prediction product that is being sold outside. What I did was I took this um, idea of prediction products. And I was thinking in my mind, in a statistician mind is, hold on a second. If this is what's going on, the better these predictions are, then they are more valuable in terms of being a prediction product. That means that a company or an internet platform will have every incentive to make their predictions as best as they can. Now, how can you make predictions good? The traditional approach and traditional, I mean, this is not so old, if you ask a statistician or a machine learner, how do you make better predictions? They'll tell you, well, build predictive models that are better, come with better predictive approaches, get better data, or if you're doing you know, deep learning and you need heavy computational stuff, build some serious computing infrastructure. And that's exactly what the big companies are doing. They hire great data scientists, they pay them a lot of money, they purchase and collect better data, they acquire new companies. Why does Facebook purchase Instagram and WhatsApp and all those? They get more data. They invest in putting together huge computing infrastructure that they all sometimes even sell and let other people use. But there's also something else that they can do. And here was where my light bulb came on and was blinking very scarily. An internet platform can use the behavior modification to push users towards their predicted behaviors. What do I mean by that and what is going on here? So first of all, when this came up to my mind, I thought maybe I'm crazy. Maybe this idea is insane. So I, I looked around and then I discovered, hold on, people have been talking about this in some other areas. Very few people, but very interesting. So media theorist Douglas Rushkoff wrote an interesting book called Team Human. And he describes in there at some point, he says the following, the better the platform does at making Mary conform to her algorithmically determined destiny, the more the platform can boast both its predictive accuracy and its ability to induce behavior change. Then I found Professor Frank Pascal at University of Maryland in the law department. And he um, wrote a book called The Black Box Society. And he was interviewed at The Intercept saying the following, Facebook's behavioral prediction works in eerie. And he worries how the company could turn algorithmic predictions into self-fulfilling prophecies since once they've made this prediction, they have a financial interest in making it true. 
So the platform has financial incentive and we know they have the technical capability to do it. Whether they're doing it intentionally at the managerial level, that is a good question. I have no evidence to this way or the other. Sometimes maybe it's not a managerial decision. Maybe a data scientist who is really pressed to prove performance um, will think, oh, that's a pretty interesting approach. I hope I'm not giving any ideas here to the data scientists on the platforms. But actually the most likely, um, I think, way that this is already happening is inadvertently. Platforms are using black box optimization algorithms that incorporate behavior modification. One well-known algorithm is called reinforcement learning. And what it does is it will use users feedback and push their behavior towards an objective function that is set by the data scientist or the algorithm design. And I think this might be something that maybe people didn't think about when, they're, when they put the algorithms in. So let me give you two imaginary scenarios. As I said, I have no proof this is happening, but I'll give you scenarios. Suppose there's a political consulting firm and they want to reach out to people who are likely to vote for Trump. Suppose we have an internet platform who wants to sell these predicted vote for Trump scores. So these are prediction products. So they want to sell it to the political consulting firm. How are they going to convince the firm that they can do good predictions? They want to showcase their predictive power. So they'll do two things. First, they'll take a bunch of their users and for these users, they'll generate vote for Trump scores. Based on these predictions, they're gonna use behavior modification and push these users towards their scores. So people who had high scores, oh, this person is likely to vote for Trump, let's show them more ads that are relevant that will push them towards Trump, or let's show them posts that will make them more uh, favorable toward voting for Trump. And in that, they will turn voting predictions into voting realities. Scenario two, suppose there's an insurance company, I don't know, car insurance, and they wanna avoid high risk customers, but they do wanna acquire new customers. So they want to get a big data set of customers with their risk um, uh, levels. And suppose we have a platform, maybe Uber, that wants to sell predicted risk scores. So how does the platform showcase its predictive power? It takes a bunch of its drivers, for example, and they generate user risk scores for them. And then they maybe engage them on their app more or less, or send them on paths that are more or less risky in order to push their behaviors towards their scores. This will result in turning the high score uh, users into high risk realities. Now you can see here that sometimes the, the, the customer, like the insurance company or the political firm, and the action of the platform are going in the same direction, but sometimes they're at odds. The insurance company probably does not want to push risky people into risky driving. Um, even in the vote for Trump example, if the um, customer is a political firm that is not a uh, Trump supporting firm, but it's a nonpartisan, then there's, they're at odds with this pushing people towards voting. I'm not talking about any ethical issues, not even yet. So these are imaginary scenarios. And um, again, the idea here is two step. You generate predictions Y hat, and once you get the, gener the predictions, you use behavior modification to push the outcomes of users towards their predicted value. And then what you get is apparently better predictions. Let me show this to you graphically. So here was our picture from before. This is the statistical approach. You have the user profile and you have the predicted user behavior and you have your predictive model. And here's the actual behavior and here's the pre uh, predicted behavior. And the distance between them is the prediction error. This is if you don't intervene. But remember that Observed user behavior is actually a function of the user's mental state. So when you purchase something or you click on something or you vote, there is a mental state behind there. And this is what's getting hacked by the behavior modification approach. And what they do is they recognize this and they modify the platform's behavior so that it affects the user's mental state, which in turn pushes the user's behavior closest, closer to the prediction. And in the end, the result is a much better and smaller so-called prediction error. So if this is the story, um, we have a bunch of questions that come up, right? Here are just three. One is, can behavior modification mask poor predictions? Can the internet platform be pretty poor at generating predictions, but mask it by doing a lot of interesting behavior modification? Another question, can customers uh, like the insurance companies, can they infer the real predictive performance without manipulation if all they get is performance uh, with manipulation? 
And a third interesting question is what's the role of personalization? To answer these, I'm going to take a statistical approach and use the tool that I showed you before. Now, what's interesting is that I need to now represent this new scenario that has manipulation in order to integrate it into the expected prediction error formula. The formula I showed you before, this one, it assumes no manipulation. But what I want is I want a formula that definitely does look at the distance between a manipulated behavior and its prediction. Unfortunately, in statistics, we can't just write equations with words like that in there. We need to have notation that we can work on with operators. So the problem that I encountered was, wait a minute, there's no notation in our world of statistics and machine learning that allows me to put in predictive relationships together with causal interventions. We have a whole huge field of people doing prediction, a whole field doing causal intervention, but they each have their own notations and there's no one unified language that allows me to put it together. So what I did was the following. Remember the notation with the hats? This is the predictive notation. It assumes no manipulation. Then I'm taking an interesting new kind of manipulation notation. There are a few different schools. I'm showing you a recent one that's very successful. And this is called the do operator. The do operator means that whatever is inside there, the do of X, means that X here is manipulated. Unlike just an X here that is observed, this one is manipulated. And the do operator was coined by Judea Pearl, a very famous computer scientist who's written a lot about causality. This whole world has a lot of wealth of um, causality derivations, but they don't have the predicted hat notations in the way I'm describing here. So what I did was I put them together in order to create a language that will allow me to look at the distance between manipulated behavior and predicted behavior. And you can see I'm using the do here is the, the platform's manipulating behavior. This is our user's profile. And now we get this little curly thing here, the tilde, which is a manipulated behavior. And you can see a little curly here on the error as well. In the picture that we had before, the do is right here. This is the course manipulating behavior. And the y curly is right here. This is the manipulated behavior right here. So now we're looking at this distance here and trying to evaluate the prediction error. I am not going to show you how I derived the formula. I'm just gonna show you quickly the result so that, and then explain what it means. So the old formula looked like this. The new formula looks like this. And it has two new strangers. One is a little curl showing up here on the error. And another thing is called Kate, which is the conditional average treatment effect. So for drivers with a medium distance, for example, this will be the average amount of risk that went up or down when I did the manipulation. I'm gonna show this formula to you on our picture. So remember we had our drivers here as circles and the predictions were the red X's here. And you see that here, the prediction is a little too high for the medium distance drivers. And here the prediction is a little too low for the, uh, for the long, long distance drivers. Then I wanna manipulate them. I wanna make these guys a little riskier. I wanna push them up and engage them on my app. And I wanna make these guys a little lower so that my predictions look better. I'm gonna do a manipulation that causes this. So the yellow dots are after manipulation. And you can see how now the driver's wrists are much closer to the prediction. So my predictions look better. And that's that Kate. And the other thing is you'll notice that the orange dots are closer to each other compared to the white dots. So now users' wrists are also more similar to each other. So what my um, formula shows is that not only are we able to generate um, uh, manipulated behaviors that are closer to the predictions, but now people's manipulated behaviors are also more similar to each other. And now I can start answering those three questions that I asked before. The first question was, can behavior modification mask poor predictions? And the answer is yes. Because remember in the formula, we have this little Kate here. If, the, if the, my algorithm is very biased, as long as I push people in the right direction, I can mask some of this bias. And more than that, I can make people seem more similar to each other because I can actually shrink this variability between driver's risks. The second question was, can the customer, you know, the, the, the insurer, can they infer the real predictive performance without manipulation if I only show them the manipulated performance? And the answer is not likely at all because the difference between the manipulation and no manipulation formulas include a bunch of terms that are very hard, if impossible, to estimate, even if you are the platform, which they are not. 
And lastly, the third question is, what's the road of personalization? Well, it plays a very interesting double role. First of all, in prediction, the better you personalize your predictions, you're going to need less modification in the next step. Secondly, you can personalize at the behavior modification step with all these tricky things that I talked about before. And the better your modification works, the better your prediction product works. So personalization plays a role in both of these steps. If you're worried about the insurance companies or the political consulting firms, I hope you're also worried about the users, about us. It raises a lot of moral concerns if this is happening or might happen. It makes users conform to their algorithmically determined destiny. These behavior modifications are done without our knowledge or consent. And optimizing the platform's commercial interest in this case is at serious odds with users' well-being and agency. I give you examples of risks. I gave you example of voting, uh, very much at odds with our human agency and well-being. I'll just mention that behavior modification in itself is not evil. These were methods developed by psychologists to improve human life and society. It's also called habit formation, behavioral change. What has been now used um, in the world of apps and platforms, typically more persuasive technology, again, coined by BJ Fogg. And he defines persuasion as an attempt to change attitudes or behaviors or both without using coercion or deception. I would say that if this strategy that I described to you is happening, there is definitely coercion, there is definitely deception, and we need to bring this up. So in summary, I showed you that internet platforms now combine prediction and behavior modification. And these imaginary scenarios might not be imaginary. I'd, glad to, I'd really be glad to hear from people who might know behind the scenes. And because um, this approach doesn't really happen in, the, in, the acad in academia, we either have people working on prediction or on manipulation and, and, and causal in, in, interventions, but we don't have academics who do both in the same lab or in the same place. This is all absent. And that's why we also don't have vocabulary, which I had to figure out and put together so that I can start analyzing it. And with the statistical tool of the extension error, I was able to show you some serious implications for the platform customers and for the users. So I hope with this, I um, gave you some interesting new thoughts and I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Galit. You're always fascinating and interesting and insightful. And uh, uh, you certainly did that again today. Uh, we have already a lot of questions in the Q&A. Um, what I'd ask everyone to do is please vote up the things you'd like Galit to handle, because we're not going to get through them all. But if you vote up by clicking the little thumbs up icon next to the question, um, it's more likely to get to the top of my list and I'll call out those ones. So we'll start with one from Nick Tierney. He says, how do you think we can defend ourselves against this? Nick, this is a great question. Um, well, what I can do is give this talk and make it very publicly available. And I invited to this talk, not only data scientists and statisticians, but I also invited some people from law. And um, you know, we need to expand and explain this and put this out so that the people who are maybe um, have some say or can help us uh, with regulation. We also care about people working in the data industry and the data scientists. If you're working in these platforms, you should be aware of it because maybe you're doing it inadvertently. Um, so I think the best way is just to make it well known and then hopefully some uh, bigger powers will, will make a change here. Okay, we'll move to uh, Monica's question. She says, I'm concerned about the way universities are exploring profiles to increase marketing to students who fit a certain profile and are more inclined to enroll in a certain course. Um, by directing follow-up calls for law to law type people and follow-up calls to data science to data science type people, we further balkanize our education. Um, if you'd like to comment on that. Well, I think that's not really the behavior modification that's happening on platforms. Um, I think what you're describing is just the use of algorithms uh, to generate predictions, which gen then generate actions. And there's a whole field now talking about algorithmic bias, uh, but it's a little bit different from what I was describing, I think here, unless I'm missing something. Uh, one from Maria. I'm from Monash Law, and I'm really interested in how to use behavior modification and data to encourage good behavior that will address environmental problems, for example, to reduce the use of plastic. Laws and regulations are ineffective in this space. Should government be using predictive approaches to regulate people's behavior here? 
Well, my suggestion is what I did is, you know, just go and check out the books of the people who did this. Economists have also been using this for a while. There's a lot of behavior modification. There's a whole field called behavior modification. Uh, you have people in uh, user interfaces who are doing it. You have people in psychology, uh, some are in business schools or just read. There's, there's a lot of books um, and papers written there. There are conferences now with these groups. They're very powerful. They're extra we're all addicted to everything because of this. So for me, it's very convincing. I have some colleagues who also do behavior modification. So I think just get familiar with this field and, and you'll find the interesting parts. Um, Mitzi is asking, based on these studies, how, if at all, are you altering your interaction with various platforms, your personal response? That, that's, a, that's, a, you know, that's the usual um, uh, question. It's like, okay, now that you know things, how are you doing things differently? Well, well, it's very hard to limit um, because even when you're limiting, when you think you're limiting, there are more devices in your house that are measuring things that you're not aware of. Um, I don't think there is a way to limit. I think there's some things that are useful. If you feel things are very addictive, turning off notifications. I don't have notifications on, on almost all my devices. Um, I also try to separate things. So uh, I have work events on some computers and other things are used for other things. And um, to be honest with you, I also use meditation. That, that works. Uh, so you have to sort of expand your toolkit and protect kids and be very fierce about it. I think the kids are the, the, the biggest victim here. Diane Cook is asking, what information or variables do you think you would need to get from the company's data in order to assess or detect manipulation? It's not about getting the data. It's getting access to do the manipulation myself. Because, um, and I'll, I'll mention, you know, there's a question I didn't answer, uh, I didn't put here, but I got a really great question from a colleague of mine who said, hold on a second, the companies are doing A-B tests all the time. Can't they detect it with the A-B test that they're doing? And the very interesting answer is no, because the A-B test that they're doing is for a different manipulation and they're randomly assigning people to A and B. So they're randomizing the effect of these sneaky manipulations. So even the come to her who have, actions on the platforms can't see it. It's not about the data that we just get from them, is you need the ability to interact and see what exactly in the, in the pushing is going on. Because you, you sometimes won't even know what is pushing. The algorithms are so black box, you don't know how the user is being pushed. You don't have the counterfactual of what they would have done had they not pushed, unless they have some control, control group. But you, know, you need to be part of the platform. You need to collaborate with the platform. Ilaha is, uh, is saying, love this presentation. Please let us know where to read or find more into your work and research. Okay, Ilaha. So, so I knew someone was going to do this. So what I did was um, I, I posted to archive the paper last night. They will probably publish it sometime today or tomorrow. So just search for the paper with the same title as this talk. Uh, presumably they can also go to your website, garlicshmoyle.com. Yes. Okay, sure. Bob is great at tweeting stuff. So <laughs> uh, we have a comment from Frank Pascali, who you quoted in your talk. He says, thank you for mentioning my black box book. I think this is a very important line of research. Do you think that platform managers will try to take advantage of the self-fulfilling prophecy effect? Or is the worry more that unsupervised machine learning will push users towards certain outcomes to affirm their own models? Wow. Okay. So I guess this, uh, this comes to how... Um suspicious you are and how trusting you are. Um, this is my personal opinion. I think it's happening inadvertently, for sure, because whoever's using reinforcement learning, they're optimizing RMSEs and error metrics that are exactly what you're trying to minimize. So I have, I'm pretty confident that this is happening because of reinforcement learning. I also have a feeling that there will be platforms, and we've seen many rogue platforms with management that is not very ethical in mind, um, who would do this. And even if it's not, again, at the CEO level, it can happen at the data science level teams. Again, there's a lot of pressure to show performance. So I don't know. I, and this is, again, where I really want to hear from the community if anybody has, you know, if you want to send anonymous posts on this. I'm, I'm really curious to know if, if people are aware that this is happening, if they have heard of this happening, if they think it can be happening. This is a great question. Thanks so much for, for attending. 
Uh, Monica has another question. What do you think of something like the algorithmic accountability bill to manage these issues compared to a bottom-up approach with more data ethics and accountability courses at university? Um, I think, again, awareness is the number one thing and understanding what these algorithms can do is a thing. I think that what's missing right now from a lot of the, um, the, the stories that are being um, put out is the issue of behavior modification. That is kind of like a separate world right now. So machine learning is talking about predictions and fairness, and, but the behavior modification, when you link them together, you create a monster. And I think that this monster is not yet well understood. So uh, yes, I think that's important. I think we need to also teach people what reinforcement learning is doing and what behavior modification is. Um, and I'll also note that, you know, some of these people who write these books uh, that encourage the platform builders and the entrepreneurs to create things. For example, uh, Nir Eyal's book, The Hooked Book, he just came out with another book that's trying to undo the evil and trying to help you hack, undo the hacking. So, you know, we think what we're doing is cool, but then after a few years, we see what monster has become from it. And then you have to inoculate everybody against the new virus that you've created, right? Okay, one from Lakshan. Uh, thanks for the really interesting talk. On some platforms, I'd imagine there are a lot of fake accounts in the list of users. Thus, fake accounts in the behavioral big data can be used to manipulate the predicted outcomes. Since the actual users can be pushed towards the predicted outcomes, that would also mean that they can also be pushed into the direction of the fake accounts. That's interesting. So you're saying, well, the question is, are, are the fake accounts also doing things or did you just open an account and not do anything? Because sometimes people will just open it. If it's a bot that's actually doing things and interacting, that's a great, that, that's a fantastic another source of uh, behavior modification. So you're right. So it can happen not just from the platform. This is, a, this is I never thought about this. This is great. It can happen by just uh, someone creating these bots and the bots are pushing each other. I think things like that happen sometimes on um, online dating sites when people put in all kinds of bots to push people to do all kinds of things. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. I will finish with, with one question from Justin, who was actually the first person to ask a question. So I think we, he deserves to have his heard. How is the contribution to E by the three sources that you mentioned understood when looking at experimental data? How do you know that it is mostly biased, for example? Okay, so I think your question about the, the expected prediction error and those pieces, like how, do, how can you even measure those different pieces? Those pieces are very hard to measure. Uh, some of them are impossible to measure, right? Um, but the, it, this tool is still super useful for us when we're developing and comparing algorithms. So even though I can't tell you, oh, um, um, you know, a deep learning has a bias of 5.3 on these data, you can't really do that because we don't know the underlying functions. We know that some algorithms have higher variance or lower variance and that, for example, increasing the sample size will help some algorithms more than it will help other algorithms uh, or regularization is going to help for some things but not for other things. So it's not so much, you're right, it's very hard to quantify those pieces. We don't typically use it to quantify the pieces and add them up and then say, oh, here's the expected prediction error. It's more to investigate the sources and understand algorithms and data and uh, be able to compare them. Great, well, I think we're out of time. So thank you everyone for such great questions and for Galit, Galit for a fascinating talk and for your insightful answers to the questions. Um, the recorded lecture will be available on the ASIMS website uh, and maybe we'll put a link to your paper there as well in case people have trouble finding it so that they can get that paper from archive. The next ASIMS virtual public lecture will be uh, by Professor Henderson from Cornell University on analytics and bikes, riding tandem with motivate to improve mobility. So go to the ASIMS website, asims.org.au to find out more information about that. And with that, we'll conclude this, this session. Thank you everyone for your contribution and especially Galit for contributing so generously. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here and thanks for all the great questions.